Welcome to Electron Line. With Mariner 9, we made huge advancements in the understanding of the planet Mars. We were able to put an orbiter in orbit around Mars and keep it there for well over a year. And we have tremendous numbers of pictures from that particular venture. Another thing that they did was the orbit that they went in had, it was very elliptical. In other words, at some point the orbit, the orbiter was less than a thousand miles away from the surface and at other times as much as over 10,000 miles away from the surface. Of course, as the orbiter went around and it wasn't going over the same location all the time, whenever it got close, the resolution improved to about 100 meters. When it was far away, the resolution was about a kilometer. So at 100 meters, that is tremendous resolution and they were able to really map out what the surface of the planet looked like. Well, it turned out they send a total of 7,329 images mapping 85% of the surface, which included all the major features, all the uh, meteor hit strikes, all the, uh, can well, what we thought were canals, but there are no canals, of course, on Mars, but we saw the, the huge uh, canyons on Mars, we saw the large plate volcanoes, we saw a number of craters, we saw the terrain, it was really a uh, a smorgasbord of information for the scientists looking at these images as they were being developed over the time. Which, what was interesting was when Mariner first got there, as well as the two Soviet orbiters, there was a huge dust storm that completely obscured the visibility of the surface. And so the, the Soviet spacecraft, they were not able to get clear pictures because it had so very poor quality. What they decided to do with the Mariner 9 is simply wait for a few months until things began to clear, and they started imaging several months later, around mid-January, therefore getting these beautiful clear pictures after things settled down and they were able to see all the features of the planet. Notice that they left uh, 30 May 1971, a little bit, about 21 days after Mariner 8 uh, was, was launched. The problem with Mariner 8 is that it didn't reach Earth's orbit, and they traced it down to a circuit board failure. And then even going further down, they, they were able to figure out that it was a single faulty diode. Can you imagine a $1 part on the circuit board caused the entire mission to fail? It's a disaster, but yes, there's so many ways in which something can fail. And unfortunately, maybe the circuit board wasn't tested correctly, maybe it wasn't built correctly, maybe it was a manufacturing defect on the part, who knows? But Yes, it was the whole mission failed because of a single $1 part that failed. But at least 21 days later, on, on the 30th of May, Mariner, ne Mariner 9 was able to reach, uh, to, to launch from Earth, to get into orbit, to boost out of orbit, to get to Mars. It took 168 days to get there, and essentially the mission ended a year later on October 27, 1972. The weight of Mariner 9 was 2,200 pounds, which was more than twice the weight of Mariner 6 and 7. Now, the reason for the extra weight is because Mariner 6 and 7 were flyby missions. Mariner 9 was a mission where you try to get into orbit, which means you have to have that additional fuel in order to slow down in larger engines, larger uh, jets, engines, that are able to slow you down sufficiently to go into orbit around the planet, so therefore the additional weight would be required. It included pretty well the same instrumentation as Mariner 6 and 7. It had an infrared radiometer. They were looking for volcanic activity, although I don't think they found any in that particular mission. Uh, and we're also able to measure temporal changes in the atmosphere, meaning as time went by, they kept on checking the atmosphere and they would see if there were any changes in the atmosphere over time. They made use of the forward error correction code methodology, of course, to most people they go, who, who cares? But for me as an engineer, that was kind of interesting because there's always going to be data uh, bits missing or incorrectly sent, which uh, causes the quality of the transmissions not to be as good, but if you have a methodology to correct that using a error correction code, then you have much better quality imaging and that improved the ability to discern uh, features on the surface of the planet. In addition to that, Mariner 9 also took photos of Phobos and Deimos, the two captured moons of Mars, and so that was the first time we got good up-close vision or pictures 
of those two moons. So it was a tremendous success, able to map 85% of the surface, getting lots of data, lots of imaging, and for the first time, we really saw what the planet looked like from an orbiter around the planet to a tremendous resolution as much as 100 meters, which is really good. So things were getting better all the time. We're beginning to learn more, more about Mars, but we still needed to land something on the surface to start making measurements of what kind of soil, what kind of rocks, and especially, is there a possibility for life to exist on Mars? So the next missions that were sent to Mars were the Viking missions, which actually landed and did experimentation on the soil, and with some very interesting results. So you want to stay tuned and see what was happening with the Viking missions and what they discovered. Still quite interesting.